Um, the, the talk, the next talk, is going to be about how to squeeze out performance out of Lambda functions. And uh, more in general, how to squeeze out performance out of massively parallel distributed transaction processing systems. I think five or six years ago, um, very few people in our industry had experience designing and working on high throughput transaction processing systems because you had to be in an investment bank or you had to be in a massive insurance company or a massive trading company to do that. But today, Hello World on Google Cloud Functions or Hello World on Lambda is in effect a massively distributed transaction processing system. So uh, th there are some design principles I'll talk about that you will be able to apply on regardless of what cloud you want to work on. And there are some very specific kind of Lambda-oriented things and Amazon-oriented things that I'll talk about because that's what I have the most experience with. Uh, so in terms of um, squeezing performance out of highly distributed transaction processing systems, there is one really, 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 really important rule. Everything else you can break. And the one really, really, really important rule is do not trust anybody telling you anything. Don't trust me, don't trust anybody else who was on the stage, don't trust people on the internet especially, because it's really cheap to post a blog post now, it's, uh, people can write stuff, but um, more importantly, not because people are malicious or they want to deceive you, because today on the cloud, stuff changes so quickly that things that had horrible workarounds a few months ago no longer need horrible workarounds. Um, Jan, who did the keynote this morning, uh, and I met a few years ago at another conference, and he had this wonderful way of getting Lambda functions to talk to SQS. Uh, I think he showed part of the diagram today. It basically looks like somebody took a baseball bat and, and smashed a kind of architectural diagram and shit went all over the place. That's how complicated it was to kind of get SQS functions to talk to Lambda. Now you have that supported out of the box. Um, one of the things that uh, happened in December uh, was this whole VPC thing that Alex talked about where um, we had uh, really big problems getting VPCs to work with Lambda functions and there was a, like a 14 second delay to get that started. There was horrible workarounds to get performance out of it. You no, longer need, you no longer need to do that. That advice is expired. Um, there's a lot of advice on the internet how to optimize uh, startup times for functions, how to avoid cold starts and things like that. And that changes all the time. Um, Performance data that people have published a year ago is probably no longer relevant. And tricks that people had a year ago, they're kind of slightly not relevant that much. Uh, there's a, uh, a lovely uh, post, set of posts by a guy called Mikhail Shilkov. I will publish all the slides. I've published all the slides already. You can download them and you have all the links in the slides. He did a research in uh, September 2019 about Lambda called starts. And you can see kind of JavaScript functions, he measured most of them start within kind of uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 seconds. Um, the, the Python functions start similarly slow. So at this point, kind of most of that advice around avoiding call starts becomes no longer that important. Um, he publishes stuff not just for AWS, he publishes stuff for Azure as well, so you can see kind of Azure call starts, this is kind of seconds, unfortunately, not milliseconds. So there's <clears throat> some other stuff, but again, very, very likely by, by today, this has been improved. And that's one of the benefits of the cloud platform, providers improve shit without you having to do stuff. Um, so uh, in terms of... Um, th this kind of stuff, th there's another set of interesting things to look at, not just optimizing for start, but optimizing what functions do. And you'll see a lot of tricks, for example, um, there was this really interesting uh, flag that was introduced in the AWS SDK uh, a few months ago, if your function talks a lot with other services. Some people have figured out that actually TCP handshakes take longer than what your function does. So if your function talks to kind of S3 three times to download two files and upload the result file, the actual TCP handshake between the Lambda and S3 might be longer than what, you do, what you're doing in code or what you're uploading. So they've introduced this flag, basically just turn the flag on, connections get reused, your Lambda start running much faster. Now, again, don't trust me, try it out. 
we tried this thing out and we realized it's kind of causing most of our functions to run faster, but about 5% of the functions were running out of like 10 seconds longer. Magic flags, so we decided not to use it. Um, so be, be kind of conscious about whenever you see a performance trick or whenever you see some kind of magic flag like this, actually test it. And, and make sure that it works for you. Um, there's another really, really interesting flag I want to talk to you about. Um, and this flag is actually, you're not going to find it in any post like this. Um, with a bit of digging, you can kind of stumble upon this flag that's kind of really curious. Because you can just kind of turn this thing on and you get a different lambda runtime and it works much, much faster. Now, undocumented flags like this are always problematic because they might change, the cloud provider might change them, they might start using something else, or they might ignore this, or they might not ignore it. So, kind of usually cloud providers would never ever recommend using something like this. And I can bet, like, we can ask Alex now, Alex is from Amazon. What, what do you think anybody would, from Amazon would kind of recommend using this? Scusa, Gaigo, questa sembra proprio una fregatura, però... Dai, dici, è una fregatura. So, you know, this is bullshit, basically. <laughs> and I, I, I literally invented this one, you know, two minutes ago to prove a point. That you shouldn't believe people on the stage. So, because I've uploaded these slides now, hopefully, you know, thousands of people are going to see this thing on Twitter or something like that. They're going to try to turn the flag on. And, you know, we'll see blog posts, people recommending this thing is used. It's complete bullshit. It's, it's kind of so, the, please, 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 test everything. Um, and that's really one of the most important things. So, um, uh, one of the things I, I like to do to test stuff is actually I've built a teeny tiny app that allows me to test things easily. And I've actually open sourced this. Um, you, you can deploy it in, in multiple regions. You can measure the latency. You can put your own function there and measure kind of stuff. So this allows me to very easily uh, measure different combinations like executing a regional API, executing a, a, an Edge API. This is currently deployed in Frankfurt. So I can say, look, I want to execute 500, 100 requests and I want to run it through a regional API. It starts running stuff and now I see, okay, you know, they've been completed like this. So I use this all the time to try things out. And then I can actually see, is this working for my app? Is this not working for my app? Is this working for some other thing? And this is what Alex was talking about as well, how you can actually get data-driven stuff to tell you whether something makes sense or not. And you can keep measuring these performance tricks because maybe something that was a brilliant performance trick six months ago no longer applies. And then you can get rid of that complex code. So um, this thing you can find and download it online um, if you... Look at um, github.com serverless pub inquisitor. We are calling it inquisitor. Um, and uh, basically what, what that allows us to do when testing these things is very, very easily deploy into multiple regions and then say, look, how is this behaving if we try from Rome to Frankfurt? How is this behaving if we try from Rome to Oregon in the US? And um, so w one of the things that is interesting to look at is this whole promise. For example, Alex talked about this of avoiding cold starts and keeping functions warm. Originally, um, as part of kind of, you know, the, the first marketing push around 2016 when people started actually using Lambda outside of Amazon, Tim Wagner, who was... He was the uh, head of the uh, Lambda project at Amazon, basically defined serverless as cap capacity on demand, you never pay for idle. You don't pay for things waiting. You th pay when things are executed. And enterprises were scared of this because enterprises are used to planning reserved capacity. So people kept asking Amazon to kind of take their money for machines waiting. And Amazon was a bit reluctant about this, but then kind of Microsoft decided in April this year, last year, to kind of create an enterprise version of this where you can actually pay for capacity that you don't need. That, that's okay. So you have this kind of premium plan, and then Jeff Bezos realized that people are taking money he could be taking. So in December this year, last year, Amazon also released an enterprise version of Lambda where you can say, look, just I, I want to give you money for 20 functions. Take my money. And Jeff Bezos took people's money. So now we have this thing, and we have a lot of blog posts that talk about how once you run this stuff, you no longer need to worry about you know, this and functions are going to run a lot faster and things like that. Now, 
I, I've actually done uh, as parameters for the Inquisitor app, you can say, look, I want to deploy this and I want these many functions provisioned. So you can very easily experiment with this stuff. And this morning from the hotel, I actually ran some tests from Rome to Frankfurt. I'm, I'm not claiming this is going to be for your app. Test it. That's my message. So kind of basically Frankfurt from Rome. Frankfurt is the closest data center you have. Um, completely cold functions when I ran a few thousand tests. Usually kind of the average was 60 milliseconds. No, this is not in Lambda. This is the total round trip from my hotel in Rome to an API gateway to a Lambda function and going back. The Lambda function does nothing. Basically, because I don't want to measure how long along the function works, it's how quickly it executes. So 60 milliseconds average to go to kind of all the round trip to Frankfurt and back. If I have warm functions, if I've already run a bunch of tests, it's not a call deployment, 52 milliseconds. If I have a completely provisioned one, 50 milliseconds. Now, at this point, this is a rounding error. We're talking about two milliseconds up or down, plus, you know, if I run the tests again, we're not necessarily going to get the same data. Um, so m you can get, like, you can see the 65% average. Th these things kind of tend to be a bit better than these things, but generally kind of cold starts are really not such a, b a big problem, assuming you do one important thing. And that important thing is to kind of optimize for start time. Kind of pretty much the first and major optimization you need to do for the Lambda platform is make your function start quickly. And this is what Alex already talked about. Don't have long initializations. Don't try to connect to five databases. Don't try to do too many things when the function starts. If you do that, you don't need to pay for provision capacity. There will be no visible difference between your code and provisioned code. So that, that's kind of the thing. So if your functions are starting up very slowly, and again, maybe that's why uh, I don't use Azure, so it's very uh, difficult for me to talk about that, but maybe that's why Azure started with provision functions, because startup times are still seem to be longer, at least according to Mikhail Shilkov there. Um, but if you do need to have some long initializations, if you don't know, kind of, a, and you can't optimize that start time to kind of do this, um, provision capacity might be good, uh, but then how much do you provision? How, how much do you, do you need? A thousand functions? Do you need 500? Do you need five? Who knows? There's a lovely blog post by Danilo Pocha, who is, is, is an Italian guy. You can download this from this URL. He talks about this um, uh, mechanism for using Amazon's auto scaling to actually track how many requests went through the provisioned functions, how many didn't. And you can basically say, oh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to target 70% of my stuff to be served by provision capacity, and it's going to change the capacity for you. So if you do need to use provision capacity, please, please, please kind of consider using this rather than just planning your own stuff because you're very likely going to be wrong. My, my number one lesson from planning capacity for high throughput transaction processing systems, I was always wrong. It's much easier to kind of do something like this. So kind of rule number two then is, is really optimize for start time, forget everything else. If you can do that, kind of things work, work magically. The second thing that's really interesting to look at, and one of the things that you know, people talk a lot, there's a lot of blog posts how you can squeeze performance out, is using regional or edge APIs. Amazon offers you two types of APIs. One is a called a regional API, which means it actually sits where, they where you've deployed it. If I deploy a regional API to Oregon, the client from Rome will have to go to Oregon over the internet to connect. The other one is called the Edge API. And the Edge APIs are basically deployed to the CDN. So it, they exist, the connection points exist in all the kind of Amazon presence points. So if I try to connect to an Edge API deployed in Oregon from Rome, I will most likely connect to Frankfurt. I guess that's the closest one. And then the request goes from Frankfurt to Oregon using Amazon's pipes, which are better than the public internet, faster, there's an edge location in Rome, so you get like connected to Rome and then go through Amazon there. So obviously that's better. There's a million blog posts about that, but I've tested it from the hotel this morning using the Inquisitor and here's the data. So kind of I've tested connecting to Frankfurt, to uh, US East 1 that's North Virginia, and I've tested connecting to US West 2 that's Oregon, I think. Now, the regional APIs going directly over the public internet tend to work faster than the edge from the hotel here in Rome. 
I've done tests from Amsterdam when I was in a conference there. I've done tests from Belgrade. I've done tests from London. Data seems to be consistent with that. Again, don't trust me. Test it yourself. See where, what region you're talking to. So you can get some basic data here. So if you're talking to functions in Frankfurt, you can expect like 50 millisecond order latency up or down. Um, if you're talking to North Virginia, 150, 160. If you're talking to the other side of the US, 250, almost 300 milliseconds. That brings me to kind of the other really, really important point about doing highly distributed networking systems, you cannot escape the network. The network is there. That's your biggest constraint. So, you know, there's a distance between here and Oregon, and, and as light travels at that speed. You can't really optimize that. So, um, basically, I, I don't think there's a, much, there's a big difference between edge APIs and regional APIs anymore. Maybe it was like that a couple of years ago. Maybe kind of... Um, things improved. Meanwhile, maybe it's kind of rooting from the hotels where I were. Maybe I'm just unlucky. But test it. But what, what, what's really, really important about something like this is that if your users are in Europe and you're deploying to US East 1, they're going to have 150 millisecond latency just because of the network. If most of your users are in the US but you've deployed to the Europe, they're going to have the same latency. So um, kind of rule number Three, really, that's important here is place the workload close to your users. Figure out where most of your users are deployed there. Or if you're globally distributed, think about globally distributing your application. Um, lots of these cloud providers have stuff that will help you do that. Not in terms of you know, faking distribution by saying, oh, I've deployed an Edge API, now everything is fast. Um, for example, if you're using Dynamo for your data, Dynamo recently launched something called Global Tables where Dynamo will synchronize multi-master data across multiple regions. So you can have data close to your users, APIs close to your users, endpoints close to your users. Um, S3 has cross-region replication. I don't think it's multi-master, but kind of it's, it's master-slave, so you can still send stuff there and, and have it distributed to other regions to be close. But Oh, you know, all the, all the undocumented performance hacks are not going to give you what this will give you if you design your app like this. Luckily, if you don't go for provision capacity, if you go for what Tim Wagner originally intended, that is never pay for idle, then you don't care if the application is distributed in two regions, one region, 20 regions. You pay for how much people use it. You're not paying for reserve capacity. So in, in um, this sense... Uh, we also need to look at another, most imp another really, really important rule of distributed systems. In patterns of enterprise architecture a million years ago, Martin Fowler defined the first rule of distributed computing. Now, if you read this on the internet, most people misquote Martin Fowler and they say that the first rule of distributed computing is this. Which is kind of, you know... You can't really do much about this. If you're deployed on Lambda, you're deployed on Google Cloud Functions, you're deployed on Azure Functions, you are distributed. Your app is distributed. So, but this is not actually what Martin Fowler wrote about. Martin Fowler in Patterns for Enterprise Architecture wrote, don't distribute your objects. Don't have one instance need to talk to 20 different instances to actually pull the data that's required for its task. In a domain-driven design terminology, what he's talking about is figuring out where are your aggregates of the data. Where, where are the blocks of data that require conceptual consistency so that we don't distribute them. Now, the way this used to work when I was doing on-premise stuff and, and things like that was figure out, well, okay, we have an account and the account has uh, a transaction summary that has to be consistent. Transaction history is kind of outside, so we can build that separately. We have, you know, all sorts of stuff. So you, you'd really carefully figure out what data sits on which machine, which you cannot if you don't control how many machines this thing runs on or what machine runs what stuff. I mean, if I deploy five Lambda functions, are they deployed to um, 20 different machines or are they deployed to one machine? I, I really don't know. So what this becomes is rather than don't distribute your objects, is kind of figure out how to avoid chattiness between different elements of your application. How do we create messages that go to these things so that 
A single function has all the data it needs in a message that receives. And this kind of often goes against the advice of creating DDD aggregates because maybe for a file upload, we need a bit of user's intent, a bit of user's data and their limits so we can process this stuff. And there's a con continual tension of these two kind of forces. So I think one of the key constraints for designing systems is how do we design this stuff so that it's kind of... Um, has all the data we need so we can do a single task, but it's not overly complicated so we clog the network, but at the same time we can reuse these objects and we can, we can reuse these designs. So one of the best uh, kind of ideas here is design the protocols between the components first. Um, lots of uh, design and architectural advice over the last 20 years tended to talk about designing the core of the application, the core of the tasks, and the integration between the components was often an afterthought. If you look at most of the stuff around web services, around uh, kind of SOAP and things like that, a data protocol transfer was almost kind of generic. Oh, you design all these objects, then we'll just do serialization and send it down the wire. And kind of doing proto buffers, doing you know magic serialization through JSON or something that doesn't really save you from this. We need to design protocols that are really kind of suited to our tasks. So kind of another thing that we need to do in, in systems like this is avoid choking points and avoid kind of a single coordination point. Usually when applications need to do some coordination, for example, you have multiple users upload into the same file, that's what in my app, the app I'm building is a collaborative editing app. People edit the same file all the time. I need to make sure that at the end, all the edits for that file end up in that file, all the edits for another file end up in another file. At some point, I need to concatenate that to an actual file. Now, I can consume these events in parallel, but if I want to append to a file, I actually need to kind of pull and, and append to it in a single point. Now, there are products like uh, uh, AppSync or the Firebase and, and things like that kind of do this heavy load for you, but sometimes you, you need to do your own stuff conceptually. Uh, it's not data, it's something else you want to coordinate. There's two good ways to coordinate to parallelize coordination on Amazon. One is to use SQS FIFO queues and the other is to use Kinesis shards. Both of these things will take inputs from multiple functions, distribute to multiple functions in a serialized way. So that, for example, if I have 50,000 users editing 5,000 files, I end up having a small number of lambdas on the other end where each lambda is getting data only about a particular file. So it can do it in sequence, but different lambdas get different files, so they can do it in parallel. These two mechanisms are different in, in uh, some interesting ways. So um, learn about them. Uh, I, I, of course, don't have a lot of time to you know, go into the details, but um, Kinesis does not scale automatically. You can scale Kinesis up to 10 times a day. It's a stream-based system. SQS is kind of a queue-based system. Uh, it will invoke as many lambda functions as uh, it can. Kinesis will invoke one lambda function per shard. So if you set up a Kinesis stream with five shards, you will never have more than five functions processing it at the same time. Kinesis will send messages from the same shard to a single function. Um, so if you have uh, sharding based on file ID or something like that, you might get a whole batch of messages for the same file going to the function. SQS will never send data from the same message group to a Lambda at the same time. It might send from different files. So it kind of depends how you want to process stuff and what your usage patterns are, but these two mechanisms can give you completely different response times and latencies based on kind of your, your batching and usage patterns. And kind of lastly, uh, I think um, a really, really important rule for working with any serverless platform is just to avoid using functions when you don't have to use functions. Lots of people consider Lambda functions, Azure Cloud functions, Google Cloud functions as the application server, middle layer. Not necessarily. I mean, I, I love the previous talk how we can go to two tier systems again because we don't necessarily need the middle tier anymore. So really consider, is this function adding value here or are we doing something that the platform can do on its own? And here's a couple of use cases that people usually use functions for that you're just introducing an intermediary that delays stuff and costs you more for no reason. So the first one is using lambdas to serve static files. 
Um, uh, Alex mentioned there's a couple of lift and shift libraries you can just set up an Express website or a Spring Boot website or something like that inside the Lambda function and then use the Lambda function as a web server to send CSS back, send JavaScript, send HTML files. Please don't. You're just paying Amazon money for stuff you don't need to. Plus, you're delaying responses to clients, you're introducing latency. There are much better ways of doing that. A typical way of solving that, put those files on an S3 bucket, put CloudFront in front of that, data will be sent close to the user, globally distributed, available. You don't really need to process that. So don't, don't use lambdas. I think you said transform, don't transport. Don't use, I love that, don't use lambdas to transport data. So um, another kind of thing that people do is people use Lambda as a gatekeeper. Usually in a three-tier app, we trust the server. Nothing before the server gets trusted, everything after the server gets trusted. The web server gets root access to the database. The web server gets full access to storage and everything. With Lambdas, you don't have to do that. And there's really no reason to use Lambdas as a gatekeeper. There are three good mechanisms for letting the client talk directly to the backend. Uh, in Amazon, you've seen a really good mechanism for that in Go for Google in the previous talk. You have IAM lets you create uh, key uh, uh, access keys that you can give to people to install in the application, um, and then you can just use the SDK. So that's really good for internal users. If you have call center operators, if you have uh, service personnel where you know that a named person is using this particular app, you can be very flex flexible and even assign individual permissions to individual people so they can talk to the backend directly. Uh, Cognito is uh, Amazon's equivalent of the Firebase auth thing. It allows you to get users to sign up, register, it's a managed user and password database, it has access policies you can assign. So you can say users in this group can upload files to this bucket, just like that. And then you have a signature version for every Lambda call, every AWS call from an SDK is cryptographically signed for you by the SDK when you send it to Amazon. That's how Amazon allows you to execute stuff. The backend stuff is not really backend. It's all available on HTTPS, and it's your database is not really yours. It's Amazon's. Kind of the data is yours, but Amazon has to protect access to it anyway. So you can basically sign requests the same way as the SDK is signing it. For example, for the file conversion stuff in, in our app, we get completely anonymous users to convert files up to 100 kilobytes. They go to an API, a Lambda function basically that says, hey, here's a signature for a request that's going to allow somebody to do something over the next five minutes, and the something is going to be upload the file up to 100 kilobytes to this particular key prefix. Nothing else. So it's like giving the client the power of attorney to do something, and then the client can go and do stuff without going through the middle layer again. It's much cheaper, much more performant, and they can talk to services that have file upload capabilities and things that you don't have to implement resumable uploads and your own stuff. Um, so as an example, here's how Cognito policies work. With Cognito policies, you can actually include pr this thing here. This thing is uh, replaced from the actual user ID when they use a policy. So what this thing basically says is, on the project bucket, allow users that are authenticated with Cognito to uh, get the object and get object data, but only if the prefix matches their user ID. So I can get my files, I can't get your files. And they can kind of list the bucket, but only kind of list their files. After you've done this, done. The client can talk directly to, the data, to kind of your storage. You don't have to use Lambda as a gatekeeper in between. Um, another thing that I really kind of see people doing lots of the time, and, and there's no reason to do that, is using Lambdas for coordination. Coordination often requires a lot of waiting. A user uploads a file, we wait for the file to be converted, we send the user data. If you've designed your tasks correctly so each of these lambdas has enough data to work on its own, what you can do is use platform events. So for example, for this app I'm building, the users will upload directly to S3. S3 says, hey, I have a new file and the file is in the PDF directory, which means, hey, people want to convert it to PDF. I, I know what I want to do after that. So there's another Lambda wakes up and says, oh, this is a PDF. I will convert to PDF. I save to the output bucket. The client is polling S3 all this time to say, is my file done? Is my file done? Is my file done? It doesn't cost anything. Kind of, eh, polling S3 is ridiculously cheap, unlike going through an API gateway. 
And when the file is done, basically the client pulls it and that's it. So um, use platform events, use CloudWatch events. There's a ton of stuff you can do to kind of coordinate step functions where you don't have to pay for waiting. Um, and uh, another thing that is really interesting is more and more of these services are getting direct ways of talking to each other. So Amazon Event Bridge can talk to a lot of other services. So if you publish to EventBridge and you want to move that message over to SNS, you don't have to put a lambda in, lambda in between. Um, API Gateway can talk to lots of other services. So the usual kind of webhook implementation uh, is, oh, you know, we put an API Gateway to receive webhooks from Stripe. Because Stripe requires a confirmation right away, what we'll do is we will confirm that we received the message and we'll send it to SNS and then process it asynchronously. People usually put a lambda function there for that. Why? I mean, an API gateway can kind of send stuff back to SNS and then SNS can send stuff to other people. Again, we're just introducing an intermediary that doesn't need to be there. If there's some specific business functionality you want to do, fine. If you're just copying data around, please don't. And kind of um, the last thing I'd like you to consider is, do you really need an API? A lo lo lots of people are kind of preconditioned the way we were building web apps in the past is, oh, we need an HTTP layer, so we'll build a web server. The web server talks to an application server. Sometimes they're on the same instance. Sometimes they're kind of even, there's a lot of balancer in between and things like that. With these services, absolutely all Amazon services, you have direct access to using HTTPS. Signature version 4, Cognito, IAM. Different levels of authentication. So IAM is good for named users. Cognito is good for users with a username and password that are kind of public. Signature version 4 is good for anonymous users. You can let people talk directly to the backend when they want to. And in particular also, you can get people invoke a Lambda function directly without an API. The API gateway is the most expensive component you will use. It costs a lot more than the Lambda function you execute. So you can actually invoke Lambda functions using Cognito. Um, in the example uh, kind of uh, Inquisitor project, you will find the template for that as well. So here you can directly invoke a Lambda function over HTTPS. It's not going through an API gateway. You kind of see the code, how it's used. But what's also interesting about this is if you look at the data, again, this is from the hotel in Rome to Frankfurt. If I look at an edge, a regional API and a Lambda, Lambda is kind of slightly faster. But again, this is within a margin of error, really. So. You, we, you know, you can see that the API gateway is adding like three milliseconds, which is amazing. Somebody built something that only adds three milliseconds for that much functionality. But at the same time, so you're not going to squeeze a lot of performance out by removing the API gateway. But the key question is, do you actually need to pay for it? Because that's the most expensive component there. And I think if you're building a, a, a web app and it's only your code that connects to your code, don't put an API in between. There's really no reason to put an API in between if you genuinely need the API, if you need other people to talk to your code. Um, so that's kind of pretty much it. Uh, I, I wrote a book about this. It's called Running Serverless. And as a small thank you for uh, you know, listening to me, there's 50% off this week on this URL. Um, the slides are available. I think I've overrun a bit. And I don't want to delay the other speakers. But I'll stay here if you have any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>